Good to be at Gateway today, and doesn't that stage look great? Sherry, I, I guess that's probably you and your team. I saw Sherry a little earlier. There we go. There we go. There we go. I don't know who's on your team, but give them our appreciation and sign them up for life. Don't let them go, okay? All right. Uh, I'm Jeff Ranson. I'm the executive pastor here. And I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. And I hope you feel the same way. This is exactly where you want to be. And uh, great things are happening. And I, I think great things might happen here today. Maybe great things have already happened in your home. Getting ready for church is always an exciting time, isn't it? Everybody's just so happy. The clock goes off and moms and dads knocks on the doors. And maybe she nudges you guys or you, or you nudge her or something. It's time to get up. Let's put on our smiles. Let's, let's have the right, the right attitudes. And we, we jump into the clothes. I'm kind of surprised that some of you fellows were allowed to walk out of the house wearing what you're wearing today. Uh, it's, it's not uncommon for my wife to have my things laid out the night before uh, just to save some of the chaos on Sunday mornings or really about any morning for the, as far as that's concerned. But everybody got out of the house, plenty of time. We got into the car. No, no, we didn't have to hurry anybody along. We had plenty of time. We got into the, in, into the car, and then we hummed hymns all the way. Isn't that the way it goes? We just hum hymns to church. Yeah, maybe not quite that way in your family. Maybe it was, but I doubt it was quite like that. This morning we're going to talk about families. Families are important. They're important to us. They're important to God. I love the story that Ken uh, Kirsten, preacher at the Olathe Christian Church in Olathe, Kansas, tells about a home with three boys. And I'm kind of partial to stories about homes with three boys because that's the kind of home that I grew up in. But this lady, unlike our home, she had three rude boys. And she'd had enough of it. So one morning they came down for breakfast and she asked the first, what would you like for breakfast? And he said, I'll take some of those stinking pancakes, woman. And she just smacked him right on the noggin. Second child, what would you like for breakfast? Woman, give me some of those stinking pancakes. Man, she just popped him right on the head too. That third child, what would you like for breakfast? And he says, well, I'll tell you one thing, woman. I don't want any of those stinking pancakes. <laughs> I don't know why I like that story, but I do. <laughs> Uh, does that sound like your family at all? Uh, at times, maybe. Maybe at times that's a little bit all of us. And, and, and even if you're a family of one, that may sound like your family on occasion. I just don't even get along with me all of the time. But families are important. And they're important to the church. And they're important to God. And so this morning in the series that we're in, this I Am a Church Member series based on a little book by uh, Dr. Tom Rainer. This morning we're going to talk about families. Now we began our study by saying we want everyone to be 100% a fully functioning member of the church. Nobody's on the sidelines, nobody's in the bleachers, but everybody is in the battle. We're all serving together because the work that God's called me to do needs to be done. Needs to be done. And I'm not going to pass my work on to somebody else. I'm not going to leave it undone. I'm going to be functioning in the member. I'm going to be contributing to the body. And I'm going to do what God has called me to do. And I'm going to do it in such a way that I am a unifying member. I believe in St. Albans. Joel is the one that brought this message. That I'm on the construction crew. I'm going to help build this thing. I'm not on the destruction crew or on the demolition team. But I'm a builder, and I'm going to build it with my positive attitude. I'm going to build it with my positive words and my encouragement. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to be tearing it down. And I'm going to do that in part by being unselfish. That was our third week. Unselfish. Now, that might mean I have to give up some of my preferences. Because if we're going to be unified, and if I'm going to be unselfish, I'm going to have to give up maybe some of my preferences. I might have to give up some of my comfort level. Because once I become a member of the body of Christ, I understand this body isn't about me. I'm not the central focus of this body. Do you know who is? I mean, certainly Christ is the head of this body. But Christ is looking for us to reach the lost. And they, the ones who aren't members, are the focus. And so I'm going to be unselfish in giving up what 
might be comfortable to me or what I might want because we need to make it such that we can introduce Jesus to the lost. And then last week, we, we, we considered praying for our leaders. And I pray that you've been doing that, and I trust that you will continue to do that, praying for your leaders, their families, our spiritual health, our studies, uh, you know, uh, uh, just everything that we can do to lead this congregation in the right way. But before we wrap the series up, we want to consider leading our families to be, everyone in our family to be healthy members by leading our families to love Christ and to love His church. A member who leads the family. Before God created parents and children, He created marriage. And when the married couple, the first married couple began begetting, He created the home. He established the home. Before there were nations, there was a family. Before there was a church, there were family relationships. Before there were friends, there were homes and home relationships. And they all began by one man married to one woman, and God sanctioned that, and that is our first and highest priority. If you're married today, your spouse should be your highest earthly relationship, your first priority. More than you love your nation, more than you love your church, more than you love your friends, your parents, love your family. And if he's blessed you with children, love your spouse first and then those children that in, uh, incorporate your family because that now becomes your highest earthly priority. And the church, we are a family. Now we're a body. We've talked about that earlier in the series in 1 Corinthians 12. Paul writes that the body of Christ is made up of a lot of different members with a lot of talents, a lot of skills, a lot of abilities, a lot of different looks, ways of doing things. And when all of our members, all of the parts of the body work as, the, as they're designed, then the body can function exactly like God envisioned. But it's more than a body. The church is a family. It's a family made up of families. And this analogy of, a, of the church being a family of families is, is brought out in, in different places in the New Testament. Uh, we see it most clearly, maybe, in Ephesians chapter 5. And if you would like to turn to that, we'll be looking at that in just a moment. But in this passage of Scripture, Paul is talking about the husbands and the wives and their relationships to each other. And then Paul writes that this is just like the relationship of Christ and His church. And this idea of marriage, it's God's idea, and he gives us the foundation on which to build it. If it's God's idea, he's going to tell us how to do it right, and he gives us the foundation, and it's not the foundation of feelings and emotion. Now, I was reading about the Leaning Tower of Pisa not long ago. You probably have heard of that and know a little bit about it. Maybe you know more about it than I do. But uh, engineers have been measuring its slow descent for centuries and now I understand that, that it had been stabilized, or at least the, 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 the descent, the slanting, has been slowed down. But right now it's 17 feet off plumb. In that article, it also talked about what Pisa means. I had no idea. You probably know this. You, you, you are smarter than I am. But Pisa means marshy land. Now what do you think about that? A group of guys get together. Shouldn't that have been a red flag? A group of guys get together and say, let's build a big tower. And let's build it right here in this area. Now, what's this called? Pisa? Marshy land? Perfect. Let's begin. Well, originally it wasn't called the Leaning Tower. It was simply called the Tower of Pisa. But it was built on marshy land, and hence the name now, the Leaning Tower of Pisa. That was the foundation. And that's what happens when we build a marriage on feelings or emotions. Now, if, if feelings and emotions are good and, and, and fine, and that may be what drew you to your spouse in the first place, but that's not the foundation on which to build the marriage. God says that that marriage is to be built on a foundation of commitment and mutual sacrificial love, just like the love Jesus has for His church. Verse 32 of Ephesians chapter 5, Paul writes, this is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. So right here in this passage of Scripture where Paul is saying, he begins the chapter by saying, wives, submit to your husbands, and then very quickly he moves to husbands, love your wives, uh, just like Christ loved the church, give yourself for your, for your spouse, just like uh, Jesus has given himself for the church. 
And, and what he is saying is there is no way to remove loving our husbands and our wives and our kids. Our kids come in in, in in chapter 6 of Ephesians. There's no way to remove love from our families, to remove that from loving Jesus and his church. It's all connected together. And so as we strive to love our families more deeply, we should also strive to lead our families to a deeper love for Jesus and into a deeper love for his church. And we can do that in part by leading our family to worship. And I don't mean just bringing our families to this place, because most of my life, I really thought we go to church to worship. But now I see it much better that a far better way to do it is to come worshiping to church. Trust me when I say church is a lot better. Our meetings, our assemblies are a lot better when we are filled with family who have been pursuing God for six days before they get here. Church as just a, a, a dose, a weekly dose of worship can be a disaster. This worship, our worship, our combined worship works best when we all arrive with something to offer God rather than coming with only seeking to get something for ourselves. Imagine what it would be like if every family in the congregation was seeking God's face on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and every day, if every family were a worshiping family, just think how exciting this place would become on Sundays and how much excitement we could generate for the worship of our Savior. What would happen if we would come to church like that, worshiping to church, filled with an awareness of the presence of God before we even reached the doors on Sunday morning. Well, for one, the worship leader's job would be much, much easier. And the intensity and the collective offering that we give God, our offering of worship, would be full on. Can you see that? People would leave a gathering like that, inspired to serve Him like never before, and then they would come back next week, bringing worship with them. Just imagine, not only how, how our homes would be if we were just committed to loving our families, but if we were also committed to loving our families so much that we want to lead them to Jesus. We want to lead them to loving His church. Now permit me, if you will, and I know you will because I'm standing in front of you, permit me to share with you what this family worship looked like in my home when I was growing up. That's, that's the best evidence I have is what my experience was. And my parents led our home in such a way that we knew they loved Jesus and they loved the church. Jesus was honestly the glue that held our family together. And their faith, the faith of my parents, wasn't something that was tucked in <laughs> to an hour or two on a day or two of the week. But their faith was modeled in our home on Monday and Tuesday and every day. Every single day. Now since mom has been sick, especially these last couple of months, very sick, we've had people tell us stories about dad too, but mom, mom more recently, but about how mom has impacted their life. And one of those stories, a sweet note uh, that was sent to joy by Sharon uh, Nutter Templeton. And uh, when, when we were little, the Ransons, my family, lived right next door to the Nutters. Three boys in my family and, 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 the, and the Nutter children, they were younger than us. But mom wanted to make sure that Jesus was introduced into that home. And, and, and Sharon was saying, and, and, and mom brought it out too, that mom invited them to church. And the two oldest Nutter girls came to church with us. Now, I barely remember that. I do remember it, but one thing, the thing I remember the most is having the two Nutter girls ride to church with us was just fine with the three Ranson boys. That was just, that was just fine. And Sharon went on to say in this note, just a couple of, uh, couple of weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, something like that, that if it were not for my mother, neither her mother or her father would be in heaven right now. Isn't that something? Here is, in, in the case, in my case, in my mom, decades before many of us had ever heard of Gateway, my mom and dad were loving this place, loving the church, loving Jesus, and trying to make a difference in the lives of others. 
and that never, ever stopped. That's what it looked like for me in my home when I was growing up. And today, my mom is still loving her church, and she's still loving her Lord. In the last, uh, last couple of months, she's been very ill. She's been in rehab from a broken hip, and it's just not been going as well as anybody wants. But you couldn't tell it by her attitude. Her first roommate was a sweet lady named Linda. Linda lives here in St. Albans, doesn't go to church. And mom was telling Linda, mom's not been here for two years since she broke her hip, her, her first hip, two years ago. But this is her church, and she loves her church. She loves her Lord. And she was telling Linda about her church and uh, told her all about the, the, the preaching, all about the families, and it was a great place to be, and Linda was discharged, and mom said, Jeff, we've got to keep working on her. We can get her. We've got to keep working on her. A couple days later, mom says, Jeff, I just realized her daughter lives in St. Albans. Maybe we can get her too. Maybe we, the family, maybe we, Gateway, maybe we can get her. That's what it, and that's what it's looked like for me my whole life, growing up in the home where parents loved the Lord. Even, even as she was being discharged, she was telling people about, about her faith. Yesterday, uh, she's at home now, and hospice is, is, is involved to a degree. And yesterday, she was telling her hospice nurse about Gateway. About Gateway. She was eating her McDonald's fish sandwich and eating her french fries, telling her hospice nurse what a great place Gateway is. And her, her hospice nurse lives just a mile away. Mom says, Jeff, we need to work on her. <laughs> we need to work on her. In the first service, here today. And again, mom's, this, this has been what, this to me is what it looks like when somebody loves not just their family, most of us love our families. But that's what it looks like when our family is what God's called it to be. And again, I'm not saying my parents did everything right. They certainly did not. But uh, in our first service today, there was a lady here, young, sweet, sweet gal, Molly, married to Adam. And Molly is, a occupation, is an occupational therapist at rehab. And mom told her all about Gateway. And she said, Jeff, you got to meet Molly. You got to meet Molly. We got to get you together. We got to give her all the Gateway contacts we can. She's in rehab. She's in re she was in rehab today. Molly and her family... We're here in church with us. That's what it looked like for me. And I think that's what kind of, that may not be a perfect example. I can't think of a better one. Maybe you have a better one. Maybe you are being a better one. And God bless you if you are. But that's what it looks like when we love, when we love our God and we love the family enough to bring them to love Him and to love the church for whom He died. So that's, that's my story. That's my history. But there's a place in Scripture where we have a man who, who does it a different way, and that's in, in Joshua, the 24th chapter. And the rest of our time, we're going to spend in this section of Scripture looking at how Joshua challenged his family and the family of Israel to step up, to be committed. Are you in? Now, at this point in Joshua 24... He's led his people to the promised land, led God's people there. They've crossed the Jordan, they've settled in. He's already given his farewell speech, and Joshua knows his life is just about over. His leadership is just about done. And so, in his final speaking to the nation, he's issuing this strong commitment to stay fully committed. Let's look at Joshua 24, verses 1 through 5. Then Joshua assembled all the tribes of Israel at Shechem, and he summoned the elders, the leaders, judges, and the officials of, of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, Long ago, your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abraham, and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates River and worshipped other gods. But I took your father Abraham from the land beyond the Euphrates and led him throughout Canaan, and gave him many descendants. I gave him Isaac, and to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau, and I assigned the hill, of the, uh, the hill country of Seir to Esau. But Jacob and his family went down to Egypt. And then I sent Moses and Aaron, and I afflicted the Egyptians by what I did there, and I brought you out. I brought you out. 
Now, I told you a little bit of my history, and now Joshua is telling these people their amazing history of God's grace, starting with Abraham. And he's reminding them of God's involvement through all of these years, what God has done. And that's our first lesson. That's our first lesson. It's not about what we can do, but it's what about God has already done. What God has already done. Joshua reminded uh, these, this nation, this, this tribe, this great tribe of people of God's care for them through the years. And one of the most striking things is that God included Abraham at all. It began with Abraham. Abraham is our father. But Abraham was a pagan. He lived in the ancient Near East, born into a home that knew nothing about God and didn't care anything about God, but God got a hold of him. God has a way of getting a hold of us, doesn't he? And amazing things can happen. God is reminding through Joshua of what he's done for them in the past. And his involvement was major. Verse 5, he says he brought them out of Egypt where they'd been slaves. Forget this, 400 years they had been slaves. That's a big deal. But that's not all. The next few verses go on to talk about God parting the Red Sea. That's a story we've heard and heard and heard. But just catch the, the majesty and the power of that brought them food in the desert, provided food in the desert of all places, provided uh, water uh, in, in the desert, all the water that they needed. Their shoes and clothing didn't wear out. You can't get a sixth grade middle schooler to go through one semester without his shoes and clothing wearing out. Uh, running shoes wear out in about four or five months, but for 40 years they wandered. And their clothing didn't wear out and God protected them from battle. You see, God's intervention and his involvement resulted in the Israelites being spared. God did it. As a matter of fact, it was God. If you know much about the Exodus or this book of Joshua, you know that probably no people group in history deserved God's providence and care any less than they did because they, they complained far more than they prayed. And they whined far more than they worshipped. Every good thing that happened, God did it for them. And so Joshua gets to the end of his life and the end of his leadership. And he makes certain to remind them of God's extravagant grace that he's displayed to them. Now, nothing about the past 40 years of wandering had anything to do with them and them earning God's grace or God's favor. They didn't earn it. It was a gift. And I want to make certain that here today, that any personal spiritual change that you've experienced in your life is not because of Gateway. It's not because of a leader or a team or an event, but it's because of God. Because God has, has extended His grace. That's it. There's nothing we can do. It's not about what we can do. It's all about what He has done and where you are in your life. Your achievements, your successes can be credited to a God who loves you. We sometimes think my trophy case and my awards and my ribbons and all of these things are because of my intelligence, my drive, my hard work. But in truth, they're due to God. He gave you this place to be born at this time into the home that you were born in. He gave you your gift mix. He gave you your intelligence, your drives, your, your, uh, your personalities. He gave it all, and He gave it all to you to bring Him glory and honor. So it's not what we have done or can do. It's what God has done. And then the second point, we must be grateful for the past, grateful for the past as we move into the future. I am sincerely grateful thankful for the family heritage that I have. But I'm equally sincere when I say I'm so thankful for the church family history that I have. The history of the Gateway uh, Congregation. Since 1956, and I think it's only right and necessary that we mention from time to time those who have carried us to this point or lifted us up to this point. Uh, some people in, in the Charleston area saw a need for a, a congregation in St. Albans built on the New Testament. And so some came from a church in Charleston, the Boulevard uh, Church that's not there now. 
But they began worshiping right here and laboring right here. And we have some of those people that, that have been with us today and some that are here right now. I think maybe Bobby Fisher Tabor was here in the first service. I don't think she's here now. Loretta Craddock may be here now. She usually comes to the second service. I don't, there's, there's precious Loretta. Smiling Helen Rose is right there she is. She's been sitting right there like these other two gals, just smiling, supporting, being positive for decades. They've been supporting decades before some of us have even come. But there's others that have been so instrumental into getting us where we are, and I think we need to mention some of those names. Uh, Keith Fisher, Bobby's, Bobby's husband. We, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't have this. We wouldn't be here where we are if, we're, if it were not for, for that guy. Glenn Templeton and his one-of-a-kind wife, Boots. My mom and dad, Jim and Mary Ranson. And then there was Bob Payne. Bob Payne and Bill Curry, they had this tricky way of teaching junior boys and intermediate boys and kept us involved. People like Mayvern Spencer. Is Mayvern here? Mayvern not here? She's usually, usually right in here. Bless her heart. Mayvern's been here for so long. Uh, Glenn and B. Matthews, maybe unfamiliar names to almost everybody, but Glenn and B. were so, just so determined that this was going to work, and it has. Jim and Pooge Nutter, Dave and Nancy Edens, gentle and humble Ralph and Opal Ruby, uh, Lloyd and Agnes Kirk. Anybody remember Lloyd and Agnes Kirk? I remember them. Uh, maybe, maybe one or two, or a few of you do. Uh, if, if you recall the story of Gateway, we bought a building that was up here by the fire department. Urban Renewal has since taken it, and we built this. But we bought that building from the Methodists, and then they moved on up on Canal Terrace. Well, it turns out that the Methodists threw uh, uh, Lloyd and Agnes Kirk in on the deal. Because <laughs> when the Methodists moved out, the Kirks didn't. I don't know if they just didn't tell Lloyd where they were going or what the deal was. Now, if you know Lloyd, that was, that was a possibility. They may just not have told Lloyd where they were going. Uh, but Lloyd and Agnes were here, and just so many, 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 many others upon whose shoulders and work we stand. I, I heard Dave Stone say this, and I think this is pretty good. If you ever see a turtle, a turtle on a fence post, you know he had some help in getting there. And I want to underscore that we must never forget, we must never forget or take for granted the sacrificial service of so many who have brought us to this point today. But let me say this, death comes to a church when our memories of the past supersede our vision for the future. I want to say that again. Death comes when, to a church when memories of our past supersede or are larger than our vision for the future. And I would rather be committed to a church that has a bright future than one who only has a bright past, a glorious past. But I believe at Gateway. I really believe we're blessed to have both. A great past. I wouldn't trade with anybody, but I think we've got a future that only God knows how far we're going. Joshua reminds the people of God's faithfulness in the past and all of God's provision, but he doesn't just leave it there. Listen to what Joshua says and records for us in the 24th chapter, verses 14 and 15. Speaking to the family of Israel. He says, Now fear the Lord and serve Him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods of your, 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 their ancestors worshipped uh, beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house... We will serve the Lord. My family is, is staying with Almighty God. Joshua was setting them up, choose any God you want. It's your choice. But if you choose any God other than my God, the Creator God, the God of the Red Sea, you're doomed for failure. Now, Dr. Da David Jeremiah says that Joshua is using kind of a sarcastic language, trying to... Uh, jolt the people into understanding that serving any God other than Yahweh is foolishness, is foolishness. And so the people respond to the challenge of Joshua in verse 16, and they say, far be it from us to forsake the Lord 
and to serve other gods. So at this crucial point in Israel's history, Joshua calls them to commitment and they respond. He's asking, are you with us? Is your family, is your family with this family? Are you committed to this spiritual family? Are you with us? And they respond, how could we possibly serve any other God? And that brings us to the third point, the final point. God doesn't just want part of you. He wants all of you. And he tells them clearly, Joshua does, if we would follow this chapter 24 on down, he tells them clearly that if they're committed to God, if they make a commitment to him, they can't have their idols too. It's not like you can have God in one hand and the God of the Amorites in, another, in the other hand. If they want to say, I'm in on what God is doing, then they have to get rid of anything that's going to steal worship from the one true God. And that's hard to get into our culture today because we tend, in, in, in our time, we tend to try to compartmentalize our life. It's like a chest of drawers. We, we spend so much time at work, and, they, and that's such a major part of our life, we've kind of got a, a drawer in the top of the chest with work on it. But we love our family, and we, we certainly ha have our family a huge part of our heart, so we've got a drawer with our family on it. And then we've got another drawer in this big chest, and it's got our hobbies on it. There's no mingling of the two or the three. It's, they're all separate and distinct. And then down at the bottom, a smaller drawer, probably the smallest container in the chest, is a, is a slot for our spiritual life. But that's far from the picture that the Bible tells of God's idea for us. He paid for us, all of us, head to toe, all of us, and he wants us to have that idea of total ownership, that attitude of ownership, and attitude is crucial in that, crucial in anything you do. I, I heard of a woman who woke up one morning and looked in a mirror, had only three hairs on her head, and she said, I think I'll braid my hair today. And she had a great day. Next day she woke up. She had two hairs on her head. She said, I think I'll wear pigtails today. It was a great day. Next morning she woke up. One hair on her head. <laughs> she said, looks like it's going to be a ponytail today. It was a great day. Don't you feel sorry for people with scant hair on their head? She woke up the next morning. She had no hairs on her head. She said, I don't have to fix my hair today. It's going to be a great day. And it was. God wants us to have that attitude of ownership. He owns every part of us, not just our work, not just our spiritual life or our family life. When we go to work, we're a Christian on the job. That's our mission field. When we're at home with our family, that's our mission field. I'm a Christian, and these are the ones that I'm leading. This is where I'm shining when I'm recreating, when I'm conducting business, when I'm involved in just commerce, whatever I'm doing. I am God's person, all of me. If I'm committed to Him, I, I am committed to to him, he wants all of you. And he wants all of your family. That is your first mission field. Now, I understand there is sometimes conflict in family, and sometimes, sadly, it's the marriage, it's, it's within the marriage itself. Often, it's because a believer is married to a non believer. And as much as we try to counsel those contemplating marriage for a Christian to marry only a Christian, don't even consider marrying a non Christian more often than we, we wish, because we wish that wouldn't happen at all, but it happens, and it does happen rather often. And that becomes tough then for God to have all of your family and all of your marriage. And so it's important in these situations for the believing spouse to so be focused on living a godly life that the unbeliever who is watching might be persuaded at some point, in some way, that that believing spouse might make the difference in leading that one to Christ. That's what Paul is saying in, the, in, in our last verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, I'm sorry, chapter 7, verse 14, where Paul writes, by God's inspiration, for the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife, and the believing wife has been sanctified through her believing husband, 
Otherwise, your children will be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. And so we are committed, called to be fully committed to Jesus. And because we're committed to Him and committed to our families, our call is to love our families to the point of leading them to Jesus and leading them to love His church, even this church. Now, I know this is not a perfect church. It's full of imperfect people, led by imperfect leaders. But we're trying to flesh out and live out the gospel of Christ. And we're inviting you to join us. There's some dads here today who need to step up. Lead your families like God has called you to. To love Him and to love the church. Mom, some of you need to step up. And be the the mom, be the wife in that home that God has called you to be. And love your family in such a way that they see your love for Jesus. And they feel and they sense and and they can tell that you love the church. That's the leader that God has called you to be. Praise team, if you want to come on up. We're about ready to close this out. So, um, So here's the invitation today. Here's the invitation. First of all, I invite you this morning to trust Jesus as your Savior with your whole heart and your whole mind and to follow that up with baptism by immersion. And if you do that at Gateway, we will add you to our membership list. And if you would rather us not do that, just let us know. But we'll do that automatically if you make that decision here. If you've made that decision somewhere else to trust Christ completely with your life, but you haven't been baptized by immersion, I invite you to take care of that today, just like the question was asked of the Apostle Paul. Before he was the Apostle Paul, I'll ask you, what are you waiting for? Arise, be baptized, and wash your sins away. And third, if you've trusted Christ somewhere else and you have been baptized by immersion and you're comfortable with that, but you want to be a part of this church body, I invite you to step out and step up and let us know that you're a believer in Jesus and that you want to join ranks with us and be a part of a biblical church, being a biblical member of a biblical church. That's the invitation, and we invite you to come. I'm going to pray, but would you stand with me as we have our time of prayer? And then we're going to sing and invite you to come. Let's pray together. God, thank you for these moments that we've been able to share, and I thank you for the way that you have loved our families, loved our church family, loved the families under the roof where we live. And God, we just pray that we will acknowledge that you reign not just in our hearts, but you reign in our homes and in our jobs and wherever we are. God, your spirit flows through us. And may we lead people in our homes and our workplaces and our places where we, we, we have membership that, uh, that they'll see you and they'll be drawn to you. Lord, especially now, we pray that if there's one here or more that have never accepted Christ, or have accepted Christ, but just want a place to belong and a place to serve and to grow, we pray that you will be honored and boldness will be on display as we enter this time of response. Lord, again, may you be honored. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.